Hello ladies and gentlemen and a very warm welcome to today's webinar which is brought to you by Shared Services Link and sponsored by Ariba, an SAP company. Today we're looking at empowering end to end and really zeroing in on three ways to close the loop in Source to Settle. So my name is Susie West and I am your host for today. I'm the founder and CEO at Shared Services Link. And I'm delighted to have with me a gentleman that I've been working with um, really for the last seven or so years, Chris Rowan, who is Solutions Marketing Network and Financial Solutions at Ariba, an SAP company. You, of course, do you have a vital role and a responsibility so far as, and so far as what you get out of today which is to make sure that you really do get your nagging questions answered. So please do make sure that you put those questions to Chris via me, and that will mean you'll need to just enter your, your, your questions um, into the red box that's highlighted here, uh, which is on your GoToWebinar panel. Submit those to me throughout the webinar itself, doesn't matter when it is. The earlier, actually, the better, uh, more chance of them being put to Chris. And I will be taking all of your questions and put them to Chris in the last 10 minutes of this webinar. So let's uh, just touch on the agenda uh, before I hand over to our guest speaker. And it's a straightforward agenda. I'm going to be looking really at the background of the session and then handing over to, to Chris, who's really going to get into the details um, of this webinar. And then we'll be taking your questions towards the end. So let's have a look at the background to this session. You like any other shared services um, leader, shared services manager, or, or a professional within the shared services world will be having a very clear endeavor, which is to improve your purchase to pay or source to settle environment. And it's been quite interesting because really I'd say from about 2008, 2009, up to, up to now, there's been a big, big focus on end to end. And Ariba came to um, Shared Services Link probably around April of this year, and we started having a very interesting discussion. And it was one level up, up above the end-to-end -end discussion. And they were talking to us about how can we help the market make sure that they're not just focusing on end-to-end, -end, but they're actually focusing on their source of settle in a closed loop sense. So they're actually making sure that yeah, from a, from um, everything that they purchased up front or every all the controls that were established up front are honored every step of the way and you can actually close off that loop so we worked together um, with Ariba an SAP company um, and we've been working specifically on a, on a program uh, which is to, to assess to what degree are corporations that largely operate shared services running a closed loop process and we um, gathered all the information and market information that we got back from a survey that we did with Ariba probably around June July time and what we've been doing is assessing and analyzing the data that's come from that that large survey very shortly the infographic will be made public but what we're going to be doing today and what Chris is doing today is actually going through the key findings from that study. So um, it's a, a really a very exciting opportunity um, to be introducing him to be going through the findings of this study. So over to you, please, Chris. Thank you, Susie. And hello, everyone. It's always a challenge to find the right time for these kinds of sessions when you have a global audience. I think we're beating the sunrise here in Northern California. But it should be up soon, so that'll be good news. Anyway, wherever you are, I invite you just to sit back, get comfortable, and we'll look at results of the survey we conducted with Shared Services Link that Susie just talked about to understand the state of affairs for shared services organizations relating to your source to settle and procure to pay operations. The fact that so many of you are on the webinar suggests that uh, these activities are vital to the performance and financial health of your enterprise. And if you have world-class processes in place, odds are that you will outperform your peers. So let's see how you can do just that. What I'll be discussing today are the survey results 
organized by four main areas where you can experience what we're calling savings leakage, where savings are slipping through your organization from a faulty process, kind of like an oil leak, but you don't see the drifts. And that's where the problem lies. You need to have metrics in place to identify the leaks so you know where to plug them. After we've looked at the leaks, we'll talk about three actions you can take to prevent them and improve business performance. So you go from out class to best in class. Let's get started. Here's an overview of what we'll be discussing today. At Ariva, we believe that achieving source to settle and procure to pay excellence delivers a valuable business advantage. This requires optimizing your end-to-end -end processes and closing the loop from source to settle, where you can be sure every order is from the right supplier and at the right price, where invoices are validated and matched before posting for payment, and where detailed line-level invoice data is fed back to your sourcing and procurement team for analysis and effective real-time spend management. Do this and you drive a proactive, highly compliant source to settle process with low cost operations and even deliver a positive impact on working capital. So a significant payback for getting it right. For those behind the curve here, a logical first step is to assess your organizational structure. So if you're operating in silos with little interaction or synergy between procurement, accounts payable, finance, and other departments, that will be an obstacle to progress. A siloed organization virtually force, forces you to focus your time and energy on lower value tactical transactional activities, the kinds of things that automation can effectively address. So consider the questions posed here. Where might your processes be broken? What are the consequences to your organization of relying on too much manual effort in source to settle activities? And finally, what are strategies you can follow to achieve world-class results? Let's find out. First, let's take a look at who responded to the survey. As you see here, a cross-section of companies from around the world. If you look at the wheel chart on the right, you'll see that there are different sized companies as measured by revenues and invoice volumes. About 60% with in 100,000 invoices or more a year, and about 20% with really large volumes, over 1 million invoices a year. When you're at those levels, the leaks can be a real challenge. But really, even with smaller volumes, the potential payback from an optimized source to settle process can be substantial. So some background and context about the survey respondents that relates to what we'll be discussing the rest of the hour. As I mentioned at the start, we'll be discussing the four ways that companies experience savings leakage and conclude with three actions to take to stop it. So let's begin with leak number one. Too many resources focused on invoice exception. You see here the reference to invoice reconciliation problems that should not have happened in the first place. And related to that, the huge growth in invoice automation. Yet for many organizations, Invoice exceptions continue to be a significant problem. In my view, there are several reasons for this. First, the decision is made to attack the problem in isolation. So an invoice-centric solution is, is the main approach. Rather than a broader solution, tightly integrated re related upstream processes, such as contracts, catalogs, purchase orders. Scanning an OCR, for example, are often considered a first step to invoice automation. But I would argue it's not a last stop. In many cases, these solutions effectively get invoices passed to AP more quickly. But they don't get invoices passed through AP more quickly. And that's reflected in the high percentages of invoice exception. Another cause of these high exception rates involves spend coverage. You'll find solutions that support the larger procure-to-pay or even source-to-settle process, but only for a small segment of spend. For example, those involving simple requisitioning and orders off catalogs. 
For other spend categories, such as complex services that may have dynamic pricing variables, pricing varies by location, time of day, quantity, those kinds of things, these solutions just can't deliver the required level of matching capabilities. So you revert back to a manual process. There's also the notion of business rules for invoice validation. Many business networks and portal solutions claim to have validation rules. But you need to probe the breadth of those rules. If they're limited to invoice header level checks or provide only limited invoice line level checking and can't support advanced matching capabilities that involve contract or tax rate details or automated account coding, then you'll likely be dealing with exceptions for many of these invoices. Bottom line, to effectively attack high exception rates in your organization, you have to assess the scope of spend that you need to address and whether your approach will deliver the precise matching capabilities you require. That's why more organizations find a business network to be so valuable. It offers the ability for business users to easily configure the business rules and catch the exception, send them back to suppliers for correction and drive straight through processing rates to the 95%, 98% range. Now I believe it's time for our first poll question, so let me hand the session back to Susie. That's great. Many thanks indeed, Chris. So coming up on your screen now is uh, the first of three polls that we've got for today's session. So what we want to find out is uh, what are your top three causes, so please do tick three of the following. Uh, for invoice exceptions today. So please do tick the boxes appropriate to your situation. Is it um, no PO or the wrong PO? Is it price or quantity discrepancy? Is it um, invoice with a, with a back date on it? Um, is it duplicate invoices? Or it, are there other data issues like it's a, a wrong legal entity that's represented? on the actual invoice or an unknown vendor or perhaps missing information. So what we're really calling out for here is your top three reasons. And if you can't bring to mind the three, then please do focus on the top one or two. 52% of you have responded, and we do like to get these response rates up past around the 70% mark, if that's possible. And just for the benefit of those that haven't been on one of our webinars before, we do, of course, share this information immediately after the poll. So it's great benchmarking information for you to be taking away. 65% uh, of you responded, so if you haven't already done so, please do respond to this poll question. Closing the poll in three, two, one, pretty much level at 65%. Let's have a look at the results coming up on your screen now. So quite interesting. Um, the results here, we've got 40% of you on the line saying that one of your our chief reasons for exceptions is there's a price or a quantity discrepancy, followed at 33% by either a wrong purchase order quoted or there's no PO quoted on the invoice, um, followed by 13% of you talking about data issues, either a wrong legal entity or an unknown vendor or missing information. 10% um, of you uh, say that exceptions are caused uh, with invoices having the incorrect date on it. Um, and also, at right at the end, um, seems to be not so, so much of a problem for most of you, but still can prove to be a very expensive problem, as we'll come on to later. 3% of you say that exceptions come from duplicate invoices mm -hmm. being received. Interesting results there. Back to you, please, Chris. Thank you, Susie. And the survey respondents we just saw pretty much reflect the survey respondents from uh, our survey. And you'll see the, uh, the top reasons for, for invoice exceptions. Very similar. So again, strong responses to the top three or four. You know, no PO or PO number, price and quantity discrepancies, wrong PO. While addressing these effectively makes sense, you'll also need to consider how you address the others as well. So wrong legal entity or unknown vendor, for example. No requester which or contact, which often relates to a non-PO invoice. An incorrect tax change. That can take a while to find and fix. Missing that ID. Invoice backdates. You may find that the reasons for some of the less common exceptions, those that fall farther to the right in this graph, 
may take a lot longer to resolve and cost a lot more. Furthermore, your list can include other invoice exception drivers that don't appear here. For example, problems with the unit of measure, missing tax information in tax summaries, missing delivery dates on order confirmations, and so on. This is where configurable rules in a business network can really help, and we'll discuss that in more detail a little later. Okay, we'll have a graph representing survey results, as you see here, on the percent of all incoming invoices with exceptions that need manual intervention. So a lot of, a lot of different results here, as you see on the left, the wheel chart, a small minority, about 8%, had less than 10% exceptions. That's the number I would argue is still too high. And 15% don't know. Now here some may feel that ignorance may be bliss. Not knowing the cost of your broken processes, well, it won't ruin your day. But do you really want to be in the dark as it relates to this metric? I don't think so. In reality, you have to deal with the facts and take proper action response to improve your processes. Now let's have a look to the right side of this slide where we've excerpted a data point from the survey results. As you'll see, 64% of respondents had more than 20% of their invoices requiring manual intervention. And below that, you see the consequences of that. Five FTEs needed just to fix those problem invoices when automation can do that for you today. Now, it's five FTEs when the estimated time spent per exception is 15 minutes. That might be accurate if invoice resolution is fairly straightforward, say, missing information that you can attain without too much effort. But what about those invoices that are more complicated? For example, they might involve complex field service activity, or you may have a service entry sheet as part of the process, or many pages of invoice detail. The time it takes to resolve these exceptions could range from 60 to 90 minutes each. So let's take, for example, 90 minutes of time to resolve an exception for 40,000 invoices. 90 minutes, hour and a half times 40,000. That comes to about 30 FTEs to handle that level of exception activity. Now, while that may be an extreme case, it does show that there's a potential spread in time and cost to resolve problem invoices. It could be unique to your supplier profile invoice processing characteristics. So where do you stand here? The only way to know for sure is to track the metric. With the potential magnitude of savings, I think you would agree that it's certainly worth the exercise. So that takes us to leap number two. Failure to match invoices against purchase orders and contracts consistently. And you see here on the slide, that's not only time consuming, but potentially damaging to financial performance. This is arguably one of the most critical activities of the procure to pay process that often gets overlooked, especially the ability to enforce contracts. You hear many stories of contracts being negotiated, but locked in cabinets and not enforced when the invoice comes through. I recall a recent Hacker Group study that surveyed companies for contract leakage. And there was a wide range of leakage moving from leaders to average performers to what it called laggards. Now for the laggards, the estimate was close to $20 million of contract leakage for every billion dollars of spend. So if you're a $5 billion company and a laggard in leakage, that's close to $100 million in lost, lost costs. That sounds a bit like lost cause. The average company was around $9 million per billion. And even world-class organizations were shown to have nearly $5 million per billion in contract leakage. Now the question to you is, do you have an idea where you fall on this scale? There could be some serious money flying out of your organization if you don't address this leak. So as you consider that possibility, let me send the session back to Susie for our next poll question. Thank you very much, Chris. So coming up on your screen, second poll question for the day, please. 
so please do respond accordingly. How do you ensure invoices are reconciled back to the contracts? So please tick the one option that represents your situation. Perhaps you don't match invoices to contracts today. Perhaps you do, but you manually match invoices to contracts. Perhaps it's partially automated. You do a manual match uh, with a contract that's captured um, and stored as a PDF, and then you manually match that with the invoice. Perhaps it's partially altered because you match the contract to the invoice at header level, but that's done in an automated fashion, but at header level. And then the final option is it's fully automated. You, you match, you reconcile back to the contract at line level against the contract and the contract terms. And this is done in an automated fashion. So if you can tick the box which represents your situation, we're only at 57% of you responding. As you know, do you like to try and get this up? So we are either touching or over 70%. So if you haven't already responded, please do so. Closing the poll in three, two, one. Let's have a look at the results. We're at 64% of you responding. Coming up on your screen now. So just walking you through um, the, the, the most common approach amongst the um, people on the phone today, on the webinar today, 40% of you say that you actually don't match invoices to contracts today. So you're absolutely on the right webinar to find out how you might be able to remedy that. Right behind, 33% of you manually match invoices to contracts. Um, then 13% of you is saying that you're fully automated, that you match at line level invoices against contract terms. So you're in a, a good and strong position. 10% of you partially automate. Um, this process um, by matching contract to invoice at header level. And 3% of you, the smallest representation on this webinar today, again, do partial automation, where you do a manual match um, with the, the invoice against the contract that's actually been captured in a PDF and stored in a PDF um, um, basis. Interesting results. Back to you, please, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Susie. Uh, certainly interesting data, and I think it reflects not the lack of interest in being able to do that matching, but the lack of understanding of the capabilities available to automate that process. So let's look at the uh, survey responses related to some key documents tied to an invoice. On the left, we see percentage of invoices that are PO-based, and our survey respondents here had 43% at 71% or more that were PO based. Now POs are useful for driving compliance and a high percentage of PO invoices is typically a good policy. But POs are not always practical, for example with recurring services. And when you can't use POs, you still need a system to drive compliance to preferred suppliers and negotiated prices. Now on the right, we see percentages of invoices that are contract based. And here we see data related to invoices linked to a contract, many fewer than to POs, which is to be expected. Almost half have over 30% of their contracts or invoices tied to contracts. Now, in many cases where you do have an invoice with a supplier on a contract, there's another question to answer. Can you enforce it? Even organizations that are shown to be world-class performers often struggle in this area. So as we look at this other survey finding and compare to the results that we just took from you, there are actually some similarities. You see here only 17% on purchase orders were uh, reconciled to incoming invoices, whereas 51% were manually or probably not matched to the stored contract information. But really, it's this ability to do the matching, that's where the rubber meets the road. And you need to know how you're addressing that. The survey responses here and the survey that we did on the webinar reinforce the notion that why you may think you have your invoicing process under control, when you begin to probe more closely, you really may not have a good way to enforce a contract. 
So as you look for ways to enforce compliance, remember the limitations of certain approaches. For example, restricting invoice checks and matches only to a blanket PO, but not the line items on the PO. This won't work for invoices with many pages of products and services, or for services with complex pricing parameters. That's where the process can break down. When you're ready to take action to improve compliance, understand that the tool or solution you choose must be able to handle contract matches for all spend categories. That's where the ability to manage the end-to-end -end process on one platform, linking invoices to contracts, catalogs, and purchase orders, makes sense. So we head to leak number three. And as we'll see, many plug these leaks with assistance from audit recovery firms. Duplicate payments, overpayments, both indicators of a broken process. You can live with them, these recoveries, and let the audit recovery firms plug some of your leaks and capture some of the savings. Or you can choose to more closely examine the broken processes and causes of your leaks, fix them yourself, and put the funds allocated to audit recovery in your pocket. And we'll see some more data from survey respondents related to this particular question. Let's have a look. On the left, 70% of respondents said they use auto recovery firms or need to. And if you probe a little farther, 23% used them a number of times in the, fa in the past. 21% used them at least once in the past three years, and 26% haven't used them because they haven't got around to it. So clearly a need for some action or partner to address a broken process and stop leakage. Alternatively, 30% don't believe they need to engage with an auto recovery firm to stop these leakage. I think the key words here are don't believe. And the last I checked, blind faith was not a good metric. Again, audit recovery is an attempt to chase the leaks after the fact. What if instead you plug the leaks? The payback from eliminating audit recovery fees is just the start. As you examine all components of return on investment from optimizing your source to settle operations end to end, the motivation to act is compelling. We'll look at these ROI components a little later. Here we have more data related to this question about audit recovery. So in this one, when I look at it again, I'm thinking that power tools might have been the more appropriate icon here. But let's delve into the numbers. First, the center yellow highlighted area. When you add those numbers up, that's 32% recovering over 1% of all payments. So savings starting at $1 million per billion, rising to $5 million per billion or more. So that's good and bad. Again, if you had the tools to automate the compliance up front, you wouldn't have to make an investment in auto recovery to recover over or duplicate payments. That goes back to the issue of contract compliance. If you can't enforce your contracts, you can't plug the leaks. And if you're a poor performer in this area, you can expect the potential recovery amount could be north of $10 million per billion. Then there's the 35% who fall into the camp of no clue. They just don't have the data. Taking the time to find out could uncover some substantial cost savings and major impact on the business. So speaking of dollars or euros in savings, how do you part with your cash? Let's find out in our next poll. Susie, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. So coming up on your screen, the third and final poll for the day. Okay, what best describes your current payment process today? Please tick the one that represents you the most accurately. Uh, mostly paper checks, mm, with many calls from suppliers about payment. Mostly paper checks, but with few calls from, from suppliers about payment. Mostly electronic payment, however many calls coming in from suppliers about payments. Mostly electronic payments, but thankfully few calls coming in from suppliers about those payments. Or is it mostly P-card payments or wire payments? Wire being uh, kind of same day 
and, and urgent payments. So please tick the box which is most representative of your payment situation. Only 57% of you responded, so if you haven't already uh, responded, please do so. Closing the poll in three, two, one. Let's have a look at those results. 63% of you responded. Coming up on your screen now, we have an out and out winner with 68% of you saying that it's actually mostly electronic and thankfully with few calls from suppliers about payments and then followed by mostly electronic with many payments from suppliers about those payments and um, the lowest representation at 3% is mostly PCAR payments or wire payments. Back to you please Chris. Thank you Susie. Uh, yeah, there's obviously top choice electronic payment really facilitates the ability to pay quickly and capture early payment discounts. So a good time to look at this area of savings leakage. So leak number four, failure to capture all potential early payment discounts. And you see here, with a broken invoice process, likelihood you're only going to capture a small percentage of those discounts. Whereas with a collaborative invoice management tool, you can get new potential from dynamic discounts and expand discounts to new groups of suppliers. So on first glance, this leak is actually larger than you might think, as the opportunity goes beyond the ability just to capture the negotiated discounts. As we'll see in a minute, an area in the survey where many respondents were not doing a great job. Suppliers that don't have contracts are great targets for discounts. The hunger is for cash. And with today's sliding scale dynamic discounts, you have completely new ways to capture them and still maintain or extend your DPO. But these discounts are out of reach without a collaborative platform for connecting with suppliers and enabling the discounts. That's another area where collaboration over a business network delivers value. So now, more data. The percentage of your suppliers that have early payment discount terms set up on contracts on the left. Typically a small percentage. We see here about 48% have 10% or less on discount terms and 29% have none. Now for those in the none camp, if there's no cash on hand, that's one thing. But organizations with a cash on hand, that's another story where really taking advantage of discounts makes good business sense and we'll get back to that. Let's consider the potential here. When you target suppliers for an e-invoicing initiative and include an early payment discount as part of that, the percentage rate of suppliers likely to take early payment discount terms will soar. As we see on this slide, up at the top, top performers with Ariba enroll 15 to 20 percent of their electronic enabled suppliers in early payment discount programs. And most of these are the small mid-sized suppliers that procurement would never touch and therefore would not have a contract in place. On the right, 30% know they are capturing less than half of their negotiated discounts, and about half don't know what they're capturing. Less than 20% capture more than 76% of discounts. That goes back to the issue of whether the cash is on hand. If you've got it, using at least some of it for early payment discount makes good economic sense. Bottom line here, the closer you get to 100% discount capture, the larger your contribution to improving financial performance. Likewise, the more you can expand a discount program to a larger group of suppliers, the larger the impact you have on your business. Recognizing that you as the buyer control the amount of money to apply to a program and the hurdle rate or rate of return you need from your use of cash. And by balancing an early payment discount program with a payment terms standardization program, you can achieve these results while also maintaining or extending your DPO. And that's something very important to your treasury group. So making them understand that it's not a trade-off, it's actually win-win. Again, remember, if you have the cash to invest, you're increasing your earnings on that cash from these discounts. Typically a double-digit return for paying early well above the rate you can earn on other short-term cash investments. What is that today? 10, 20 basis points? At Ariba, 
we have customers that use discount savings to fund a larger procure-to-pay initiative. And when you think about it, mining payables for early payment discount opportunities is a much better way for AP to spend its time than performing data entry on scanned invoices, fixing invoice errors, or answering phone calls from suppliers about when they're going to get paid. So we've looked at all the four leaks that our survey respondents addressed in this survey. And we framed the challenges. We've identified the four areas of savings leakage. Too many resources focused on invoice exceptions. Failure to consistently match invoices to POs and contracts. Duplicate and overpayments on invoices. And failure to capture all early payment discounts. What this doesn't take into account is what could your staff be doing instead of supporting a broken process. That's an important consideration as you assess the payback from empowering your end-to-end -end source to settle process. So what are some steps you can take to plug your leaks? Let's have a look. Best practice number one, align finance and procurement culturally. As this slide explains, alignment is key with a number one cause of invoice exceptions relating to problems with a purchase order. And here, from our survey results, many people agree. As you see in the text at the bottom, 76% see the need for alignment, 24% are not aligned or barely aligned, and 45% of survey respondents said they are only somewhat aligned. It would be interesting to see the different shades of gray in the somewhat aligned camp where the alignment exists, and where it could be improved. Of course, alignment is only effective if you have the right processes in place to support it. That includes strong PO invoice matching capabilities, support for contract invoicing, and service entry sheets if complex services are part of the mix. At Ariba, we're finding that contract invoicing is becoming a hugely popular business process improvement option for non-PO invoices where you can provide suppliers with visibility and online accent, access to relevant contract data and allow them to create an invoice from that contract data. That's a huge step forward. Just like a PO flip, if you're familiar with that term, for turning a PO into an invoice with a few mouse clicks, you can flip an invoice into a contract or a contract into an invoice. For contract invoicing, though, you can't settle for only blanket PO support or just header level matching capabilities. If you can't match invoices at line levels and have support for matrix pricing with many dynamic variables, you will continue to experience leaking in that portion of your spend. Okay, we're at best practice number two now. Resolve exceptions at the source systematically. We see again the top causes of invoice exceptions. They involve POs, price and quantity discrepancies on POs, wrong POs. How do you deal with them? Let automation take over. They can resolve, the automation can resolve the exceptions at the source so your staff can focus on strategic activity. This goes back to our discussion about where you want your staff spending their time. Do you want them fussing with errors and exceptions? which is primarily what they'll be doing if you have 20%, 30%, 40% or more of your invoice with exceptions. I like to use a baseball analogy to illustrate this point. In a baseball game, 90% of the time there's actually no action to influence the outcome of a game. It's between innings, a manager walks out to the mound, the relief pitcher comes in from the bullpen. Only 10% of the time does the action in a baseball game influence the outcome. In a manually intensive procure-to-pay process, 90% of the time is spent fixing problems, performing data entry, answering supplier phone calls about payment status, all low-value activities that divert your attention from higher value, more strategic work. Isn't it better that 90% of your time or more be focused on having your staff identify early payment discount opportunities. Drive suppliers to a collaborative electronic invoice process over a business network. Monitor supplier performance. 
support procurement efforts to enforce compliance. Again, the checkpoint at the bottom shows you the way. Let technology handle the ex exceptions at the, so at the source. With business networks today, configurable business rules make this happen. And that includes advanced matching capabilities, such as automatically matching tax rates by purchase type, automatically applying account codes, and matching non-PO invoices to contract terms. So you can enforce what procurement has negotiated. Just make sure that the solution you consider provides the breadth of invoice validation and matching capabilities that you require and can scale across all your spend categories. So finally, we have best practice number three. Tap the power of a business network platform for true end-to-end -end collaboration. And what's important here is the ability to use a business network to engage source to settle internally and externally, facilitating collaboration in both manners. Now this slide has a lot of information here. Let me just reinforce some of the main points. One, promoting alignment internally and streamlining business processes that span from sourcing and contracting onto invoice and payment. Closing the loop is key. By promoting collaboration across internal departments, you drive operational efficiency from sourcing through payment and at the same time capture all the invoice data and share it with your sourcing and procurement team. By doing that, it's so much easier for them to monitor supplier performance and better manage spend. The result? Procurement spends less time monitoring transactions and more time on strategic sourcing activities. You move from a reactive organization to a proactive organization in procurement and AP. With AP and procurement in alignment, you shift the perception of accounts payable from a cost center to a profit center. Equally important, a business network extends your processes to your suppliers and other business partners to enable collaboration that really is the key to the return on investment. The ability to manage business commerce on one platform over a network to collaborate across this end-to-end -end process is the advantage in today's network economy. Taking this approach, as we see on the bottom of this slide, you can resolve the, dis the disconnect where 87% say their payables technology is partially integrated, but 51% still aren't able to automatically reconcile invoices with contract information. Getting alignment, leveraging a business network for collaboration, that's when you can make it happen. So finally, in summary, here are three steps you can take to really transform your source to sell and procure to pay operations and achieve world-class results. We've talked repeatedly about finance and procurement alignment. The payback from doing that spans many dimensions. Lower operational costs, virtually eliminate exception management, enforce compliance, and optimize working capital. When you look at the components of the return on investment, there's a simple way to get a very rough estimate on the value you can expect. Just remember these numbers. One, two, three, four, five. So at one, that's one million per billion in expected operational savings, the cost reduction from a more efficient process. Two, that's two million per billion in working capital impact to the extent that I'm sorry, two million per billion in early payment discount savings. These are the results we're getting from top performers. Three is the three million per billion in working capital impact to the extent that you can combine a dynamic discount program with term extensions and extend your DPO. You can free up close to three million dollars in working capital for every billion dollars per day of DPO expansion, extension. Four. 4 million per billion. That's contract compliance savings taken from a Hackett study by moving from an average performer to a world-class performer in preventing contract leakage. But really, the savings here can be many times higher, especially if you fall into the laggard camp. 
And finally, five. Five million per billion by driving more spend off catalogs. So you can ensure early on in the process that you are buying from a contracted supplier at the contracted price. So when you add these together, you have a baseline of 15 million per billion. Can go up much higher than that. And of course, these are back of the napkin calculations. And in most cases, conservative estimates based upon the many value engineering consulting engagements we have performed with clients. Next, know the source of your savings leakage. Invoice exception rates for all types of invoices. Amounts captured from auto recovery. Percentage of suppliers on early payment discounts. Percentage of negotiated discounts captured and missed. Now, there are other KPIs that you may want to track. A few that come to mind are on-time payment percentage, requisition to order cycle time, average invoice processing time, etc. You need to decide on the metrics that are most important to you and institute programs and policies along with technology to deliver the cost savings. Finally, collaboration over a business network. That's the advantage today in a networked economy. This involves more than setting up a portal. A true business network today offers portal access, but so much more. It enables many buyers to connect with many suppliers, not in a one-to-one -one manner like EDI or one-to-many with portals. Instead, you tap the power of a shared network community so that you can transact online, not offline. Accommodate many document types, not just invoices and purchase orders, but also contracts, catalogs, order confirmation, advanced ship notices, payment with remittance detail. A business network also makes it possible to manage cash collaboratively to the benefit of both trading partners, to collect data that can be used to better manage spend, and most importantly for your suppliers to leverage an e-commerce channel to increase the amount of business they do with you and their other customers, as well as find new, new business opportunities not just in local markets, but around the world. So take a supplier like Charles Seafood Supply, which used the Ariba network to reduce late payments by 80% and increase their order accuracy by 75%. Or a supplier like Fastener Distributor Fastenal, which benefited from connectivity over a business network to reduce its DSO by 27 days. Or EBSCO, a leading information services provider, that used the Ariba network to increase business by 30% and achieve a 99% customer retention rate. A business network provides advantages to both business partners, helps suppliers of all sizes gain an equal footing in a network economy, and strengthens your relationships with them. So finally here, we've come to our last slide, which you can read at your leisure. But to quickly embellish what you see here, over 1 million trading partners on the Ariba network transact more than $700 billion in annual business commerce. That's more than double the volume of eBay and Amazon combined. And the transactions don't involve just POs and invoices, but contracts, order confirmations, advanced ship notices, payment and remittance, the key documents and transactions you need to conduct business on a global scale. And instead of having your IT resources focused on trying to mesh together point solutions from multiple niche vendors, Ariba offers on one platform a comprehensive suite of cloud-based applications, from sourcing, spend analysis, contract management, and catalog management, to PO and invoice automation, dynamic discounting, and electronic payment. The end result is that your organization can run simpler and run better to stop your leaks, and close the loop from source to settle. So that concludes the formal presentation. I want to thank everyone on the webinar for their interest in the topic. As you'll see here, too, I've included contact information as well for any follow-up you may have. And with that, I'll turn the session back to Susie for any Q&A. That was great. Many thanks indeed, Chris. Um, many comments coming through to me. Uh, very interested in the data, wanting to have access to the data, and very grateful for the, the data that's been shared. So thank you, Chris, for sharing it. 
um, in such a, an informative way. Um, just for the benefit of everyone that has asked, so the slides will be shared with you afterwards, as we do with all of our webinars. Um, if you would like a copy of the infographic, uh, that will be made available on our website over the next few days. So you will need to log on to shedservicesLink.com and uh, download the infographic there. Now let's move through to questions. We do have many questions coming through. So, um, Chris, my first question for you, what is the average discount that the 15 to 20 percent of suppliers um, offered a dynamic discounting actually um, give? This is, I'm, I'm reading this exactly. So, what is the average discount, I suppose, uh, that say that your, your top 15 or 20 percent suppliers that are using dynamic discounting might be offered? We know that the that, that varies by the, the profile of the supplier groups. What we find is that uh, there are different groups of suppliers have both a propensity to take the discounts and to the extent that they need cash more or less, what they're willing to pay for it. Um, you know, a 2% 10 net 30 discount is pretty common, uh, but they do vary, again, depending upon, uh, you know, the profile of the, of the suppliers that the particular customer has. And that's where we have a working capital management services team that brings the expertise and consulting they'll actually go in and perform a consulting engagement to really uh, assess the supplier base that you have and use the knowledge we have with other customers to, uh, to really give you that information and share it with you in a much more precise and, and defined manner. Okay, great. Because you, you mentioned in, in a really nice way that you articulated those savings of 15 million per billion, the one, two, three, four, five. Um, I think it was a two million that represented, two million per billion that represented savings. Um, for dynamic discounting, if I have understood correctly, um, in your experience, Chris, what what can the uh, how likely is it that the percentage can be higher than that? Oh, it, I mean that's just a sort of a, a ballpark average. Uh, again, it, the the return from from discounts is influenced by several variables. First. The, uh, how aggressive a customer is in, in reaching out to offering the discounts. In many cases, um, the programs probably don't achieve their full potential because uh, customers kind of restrict the, the outreach. And again, typically we'll find that you know, it's the small and mid-sized suppliers. Those are the ones that are really going to be in, in most need for cash and are looking for discounts. So uh, to the extent that you can target those in a more aggressive way, certainly, you know, Three million per, per billion is possible. It's it's not a an upper end, um, but it's just a matter of how you choose to scope your your initial effort. And oftentimes too, it'll go in waves. So uh, there might be the first wave where you get your you know one and a half million in discounts. But as you add on to that and moving along over time, that's where your discount potential will increase and grow um, to you know levels above what the average customer might get. Good, thank you. Um, a question here from a viewer. Um, I'm reading it exactly. I have used contracts, info records, POs, uh, catalogs, and portals, but all these are tools used to meet a specific business need. How can process controls and corporate policies support the usage of these tools? Right. How can uh, corporate policy support it? Well, first of all, it has to. You have to have the policy in place to to make it work. Um, you know, in many cases, in, in all cases, um, organizations need to really look at how they're doing things. What is the process uh, from end to end uh, where a supplier is sourced, where a contract is established, and how it's enforced uh, when the invoice comes in. And you can't just employ the technology without also looking at the business processes in place to, you know, eliminate extra steps and to create a more efficient uh, way of going from source to settle. Um, now, uh, <clears throat> what's important also in that effort is to engage many different stakeholders in the initiative. You have to have buy-in across departments and upper level management support because if you get a narrow group of people that are driving an initiative, it can stall once the, once the, the deal gets done and people um, sort of lose momentum and interest and in other uh, higher priority projects might come into play. So very important early on, get all the stakeholders in play, decision makers, upper management to buy in because they're going to drive the support and backing that's needed 
to kind of enforce the change that's going to be required to improve a process going from end to end. So again, if you're just looking at putting these... You see? Sorry? Please go, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, as I was just getting back to the point about it, it almost sounded like approaching these solutions in isolation one by one, contracts, catalogs, um, and I'm not sure if it's you know from different vendors on, on one platform. Certainly, it's a lot easier when you bring it onto one platform rather than getting you know solutions from different sources and then trying to tie them all together. This is my question for you, and it's really kind of building on that question that the viewer put in earlier. Um, to, in your experience, uh, how educated are you finding senior leadership teams? Um, are on this subject. I mean, the the one, two, three, four, five, the fifteen million per billion in savings that are available by stopping these leakages. Are you finding that um, the senior leadership teams in, within large corporations are educated on this being a problem, or are you finding that part of your kind of role um, is to actually educate them on the size of the problem? Absolutely, educate them on the size of the problem, and I want to also then again emphasize that you know the one two three four five is sort of a baseline very easy to remember um, return on investment first first guess and it's basically ranking the returns in these different areas um, what Ariba has is a value engineering consulting team uh, much like a big six consultant and they'll go in and work with a customer uh, free engagement to um, to help to look at the data look at the supplier profile look at the business processes in place and really precisely define a business case that uh, is going to be much more realistic than just by doing this, you know, rough guess one to five. Um, but it, which is why, and to that, to the point of the question, um, I, I don't believe uh, leaders and companies today recognize the uh, the return and value that you can get by optimizing this end-to-end -end process, particularly in in, in the contract area, uh, because many organizations don't have a handle on on the contract and the amount of money they're uh, they're leaking by not being able to enforce contracts number one and then secondarily on the early payment discount front uh, I think an area of education is is needed within the Treasury organization to kind of make them understand that uh, yeah you can earn the cash but you you can do it in a way that's not going to negatively impact DPO because I think treasurers are more interested in um, kind of minimizing risk and managing DPO compared to their cash earnings. And when you can explain that you know, an early payment discount is an incredible return on cash with absolutely no risk, and to balance it with a payment terms extension program where it's practical in cases where you know, a, a company may have maybe be paying sooner than, uh, than its peers in its industry, it actually makes sense to stretch payment terms uh, you know, more holistically and then provide the incentive for early payment with a discount. I mean, these are huge opportunities I think Treasury is beginning to get a handle on, but really, uh, you know, we need to have the, uh, the or people in the company that are closer to the process talk to Treasury and, and help help them understand, uh, you know, this aspect of that particular component of the value proposition and business case, mm -hmm. so they can get buy-in and help drive an initiative. Great, thank you. This this takes me very nicely onto my. Um, next question, really just two, time for two more questions, so um, let's have a look at this one, which is connected to what you were just saying here. A couple of times you've mentioned alignment between accounts payable and sourcing. From this viewer's experience, accounts payable has a more financial focus, sourcing is more focused on supply chain needs and getting savings from long-term long contracts and volume rebates. Could you just refer to a couple of meaningful KPIs that sourcing and accounts payable and possibly treasury um, based on your response just there, Chris, actually can have in common, which kind of gets them all moving in the same direction and gets them aligned. Right. So metrics, um, you know, for well, contract compliance is, is an important metric that I think few companies really have a handle on, and yeah, I think the uh, the alignment is is more AP and procurement. And to the extent that accounts payable by automating the invoice process, and as part of that, is able to capture the line level invoice detail, that becomes very important to really uh, analyze 
spin and suppliers, consolidate suppliers uh, in a way that is very inefficient, often not done well, if at all, if everything's manual and paper-based. So it, it's capturing the data, sharing that information across organizations, breaking down silos. Uh, it's when organizations are operating in silos where, you know, in, in procurement and, and sourcing might be tight, you know, working tightly together, AP and finance tightly together. Uh, IT is doing, you know, other projects, but there's not the, the opportunity to engage and collaborate to the larger business good when you look at when you can holistically streamline this end-to-end -end source to settle process and the benefit it can bring every step of the way from sourcing on the back end all the way to invoicing and payment uh, at, at the tail end and getting your discounts. So, um, okay, I could, what, I'm going to have to um, just um, let, let's, let's wrap that now because um, we're, we are running out of time, um, but it sounds like contract, contract compliance should be a, a kind of a key chief KPI for a lot of people. Very brief answer because we are running over. Um, what is the average time frame it takes for a company to implement such a solution in order to achieve best practice results? What kind of time frame are we looking at, Chris? Well, that's, that's like saying um, it, it's, it's not a simple question because it depends on several factors. One, the level of sophistication and maturity of the customer in question and the scope of the project. So, you know, if you're looking to focus on, you know, one aspect of the um, of a source to settle project, say invoicing, that's one thing uh, versus, say, sourcing or, or implementing a contract. If you're looking to tackle everything at once, obviously a much, much uh, larger effort and engagement that's involved and more time for the deployment. This, again, is where a value engineering consulting engagement, which we have a, a, a team that handles that, offers at no charge that can really help identify uh, that based upon the pre precise requirements and infrastructure and state of a particular uh, prospect and customer. Chris, many thanks indeed. That's been a real pleasure. And thank you to our audience for joining us today. Many thanks for your engagement, your participation, and your questions. Uh, do make sure that you join us for our next webinar that we've got coming up. If you haven't already registered for that, uh, please do register on sharedservicelink.com. And ladies and gentlemen, we look forward to welcoming you next time. Goodbye.